he wrote everything down. Um, a lot of a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of it would be just legal pads that you just go through, and the whole thing would be full. And then you get another one underneath it, and the whole thing would be full. And it just not necessarily. He never wrote instructions. He'd just write notes like rising sun, cello, chunky cello part with wobble, you know, something just in his language, you know. And Jeff looks at him and is like, oh, great, wobble, yeah. You know, oh, we're going to put wobble on there and a bit of chunk there. You know, I'm like, okay, you know, they obviously knew what they were talking about. And so, you know, it was, you know, sometimes you had the whole thing of what he wanted. And sometimes you just had nothing to go on, you know, so, and uh, I think he wanted to just get as much down as possible when he felt comfortable. So we'd have, say, four guitar takes and um, three vocal takes on every song. So when, even though we knew which ones were the right ones, when, when it came to make the album, it made it a lot easier because if there was ever a dodgy line or a dodgy note, there were four other tracks to choose from. I mean, a lot of times we'd, we'd redo the bass because my dad never brought anyone in to play bass. He'd just play bass for three verses and then get a bit bored and just start mucking about in the fourth verse. So, you know, Jeff would go through and we'd play the bass or I'd play another acoustic guitar track. And the minimal amount of work, even though it was a lot of work for Jeff and I, in terms of the actual songs themselves, um, I think there was only one that was really... A bit washy in terms of the layout, but it was all there and everything was there. It was just a question of us not understanding it rather than it not being there. And as soon as we understood how it was supposed to go, it was clear to us. So the blueprints were completely there for the, for the whole album. The reason this turned out to be so good in terms of the uh, just the way that the songs are really true to him is that he wrote these songs just primarily for for himself and what he wanted to hear and if he had a song in his head he'd write it down and get it in a demo form and he'd always planned to record them properly and then it got to the point where the demos got to be so good um, and we'd worked on them for so long that he said oh maybe I'll just do an album of posh demos but um <clears throat> You know, we ran out of time, unfortunately. We never got to get to that stage. So the final kind of stages, uh, Jeff and I completed. We'd been working on it, so the momentum was there. And afterwards, you know, we'd already booked the time with Jeff and everything. And afterwards, even though it was so soon after, the energy was there and it felt right. It was the happiest and the saddest thing that we've ever had to do. It was such a privilege and an honor to work on a record like this. And so sad that he couldn't be there to do it for us, you know? And so it was like a mixture of emotions. And it was a really hard emotionally for all for Jeff as well. You know, I could tell that to get this record done, we'd always just finish a track, listen to it, go way for a second, and then both just go, you know, and nearly cry because it was just once you have the realization that how well it's going, then you just you wish you could have heard it. He gave me the experience to be able to work with Jeff Lynn and be able to play music and play on a record like this and co-produce a record like this and have input. And I think he always knew that I really, I mean, we worked together, but never something this scale, you know? And he, uh, he gave me the experience of being able to design artwork and do a commercial album, you know? He gave me the experience of being able to get all the horrible business side of it as well, you know? So it's, I think he knew what I was in for, and I kind of did, but not to the extent that I thought I did. I've worked with George so much that having his input is like, you know, one of the big components. And that's where Danny came in, a big help, because uh, George had told Danny that a lot of the things that he he would like to have done on them, on the songs. And he left us a few little clues, like little string runs done on an emulator, you know, just to show where he thought they should be. On this record, his slide guitar is priceless, you know, because he's got such a touch, I've never heard anything like it. And 
he can just send shivers up the back of your neck just by just doing one note on a slide guitar. So perfectly accurate and the vibrato is just spot on. And it's just bluesy, you know, soulful. As soon as he picks up a guitar, it sounds like George Harrison. Um, did a couple of tricks in the mixing by reamping a couple of them. The ones that were a bit soft, maybe just lifted them out with a little bit more edge on them so they cut through better. Um, but really, you don't really have to do anything to George's slide guitar to, to, to make it better. All you can do is make it different. Brainwash, that's George. That's typical George. Uh, Brainwash is, is a great song. It's really clever. The construction of it is very, very clever. The words are funny and and very meaningful and he really believed in it, you know. He had done a lot of work, um, you know, previously over the last, I would say, last three or four years, writing all these songs. And um, each one he, he came, when he'd come round, he'd bring a new song and they were all this really high quality stuff. Uh, one of them was Rising Sun and it just knocked me out, even just him just playing on his little tiny ukulele. You could tell it was a, a really great song. Uh, he had all the words and everything. On Rising Sun, I used this room, which is just the big room at my house, and uh, the very big room at my house. Uh, and it was, um, it was actually wonderful. We had uh, two cellos and a, a bass, which you call contrabass, I think, in classical terms, but I call them a double bass. I'm from Birmingham and uh, that was a really great sound and we had eight violins and all set up in here all at once and it was just an incredibly good sound. The song Looking For My Life when I first heard that uh, was when in the sessions when I started to mix all the songs and, and work on the songs and fix some of them up, you know, which, and that was one that wasn't finished. And, but as soon as I heard the, 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 the lyric, but with that tune, it was just, and he was, and he was crooning on the, looking for my life. You know, he was singing so well, and it, you know, it was astonishing. Marwa Blues, um, when I first got it to, to, to work on, it was like, like this complete jumble of, of uh, there was like five lead guitar tracks all going at once, doing different tunes. And I thought, how the hell are we going to sort this out? And gradually, over a period of days, after listening to every single one, every single note that he played in every one, we realised what it was and we found the tune amongst all these extra ones that he, where he was just noodling and, you know, trying out the tune. I remember Danny just being over the moon because we'd, we'd finally solved the puzzle of Marwa Blues. He wrote songs like nobody else. They always had very tricky chords. Uh, I mean, not always, but there were, there were lots of diminished and things like that in the songs. And uh, where pe a lot of people feared to tread, he would go into new chord sequences that, you know, that really hadn't been used, which was real bold, you know? And, cos, you know, we, we're usually stuck with the rock and roll chords, you know, the ones, but George would take it a step further. <laughs> 